Hi, I'm Anfa. In this video, I'll introduce you to Ardor's user interface. In the previous video, we've discussed Ardor's initial configuration. Now that we have that done, the editor is waiting for us. In this video, I'll show you around the main view of Ardor's interface, specifically the toolbar. I won't explain everything as that would take way too long, but hopefully after watching, you'll have an idea of what everything here does and perhaps know a few keywords that will help you get more information if you need it. Let's go! Here's a fresh Ardor session. By default, Ardor starts with the editor window open. It's one of the three main areas of Ardor, the other two being the mixer window and the preferences window. The editor can be divided into two main areas, the toolbar and the timeline. In this video, I'll only focus on the toolbar, which is shared between all three windows. First, we have the main menu. Here we can access a lot of Ardor's features. A few noteworthy places are Edit Preferences, which will allow you to configure Ardor's behavior and appearance. For example, in Edit Preferences Appearance Toolbar, you can choose what's visible on the toolbar, of course. Session Properties is where you can change settings that can differ between sessions. And Window Keyboard Shortcuts is where you can inspect and modify all keyboard bindings. Before we go further, I want to point out that many elements of Ardor's interface have extensive tooltips. Just hover your mouse over something and wait until the tooltip is displayed. It's a great way to organically discover Ardor's functions and hotkeys as you go along. Back to the UI. To the right of the main menu, there's a panel called Status Bar. You can right-click on it to enable or disable different parts of it. Now let's break it down. File shows what file format the audio will be recorded in. You can change this in Session Properties Media. DC shows the type of timecode used for this session. You can change this in Session Properties Timecode. Audio shows current sampling rate and buffer size. I've talked about changing these in the previous video. Buffers. This shows the usage of disk buffers for playback and capture. Higher is better. You can change the size of the disk buffers in Edit Preferences Audio. DSP is showing the current digital signal processing load on your system. If it approaches 100%, you'll get X runs during playback and recording. Disk shows how long you can record before your storage is full. Clock displays the current time. It's useful when you run Ardor in full screen mode. And this is the log button. It will open the log window where you can find various messages. The LED's color indicates what's going on. Black means no unread messages. Green is unread information messages. Yellow means unread warnings and red indicates unread error messages. Now let's enable the X-Run display. X will show the number of incomplete audio buffers due to DSP overload. If this goes up all the time, you should do something about it. Below the main menu, there's a panel with transport controls. This is MIDI Panic. When you click it, it'll stop all currently playing MIDI notes. Useful when something gets stuck. The next button toggles the metronome, or click. You can configure it in Edit Preferences Metronome. Next, we have two buttons that will move the playhead to the start and the end of the session. After that, there's a Play Loop button. It's grayed out because we have no loop markers in our session yet. Next is Play Range Selection button. It'll play whatever is selected in the timeline. After that, there's play stop buttons. Nothing special here. And last in this row, the record button. This is a toggle that arms the session for recording. Once it's activated, you need to press the play button to actually start the capture. 
I'll talk about recording in detail in another video. Below, there's an external sync toggle. By default, it's set to internal transport sync. If you activate it, it'll switch ardor to an external sync source. You can set what source that will be in Edit Preferences Sync. To the right, there's the shuttle speed control. You can use this to fast forward or rewind the playback. You can right click on the shuttle to configure how it works. I guess the only thing that needs explanation here is the sprung wheel mode. Sprung will reset to zero whenever you release your mouse from the shuttle. Wheel, on the other hand, will maintain whatever speed you left it at. Also, by default, Ardor will drop the sound level by 12 decibels when you fast forward or fast rewind to avoid painful screeching noises. You can disable that in Edit Preferences Transport. Next section to the right houses some options for recording. The punch in and punch out toggles will allow you to choose points in the timeline where Ardol will automatically enable and disable recording. Obviously, you need to set the punch markers in order for this to work. Below that, there's a toggle for non-layered recording. By default, Ardor will not remove all recordings when you record on top of them. With the non-layered recording active, only the last captured region will remain on top. This is non-destructive. It doesn't remove any files from the disk. Next section to the right, there are two toggles governing the behavior of the playhead. By default, when you use the range tool, the playhead stays where it was. If you enable follow range, the playhead will jump to the start of a range you select and also using the spacebar will activate the play selection instead of play. This is great if you want to audition parts of your timeline. Below that, there's the auto return toggle. When enabled, the playhead will return to its starting position after playback stops. That's very useful if you want to repeatedly listen to a part of your timeline and don't want to manually reposition your playhead every time. Next section to the right is the primary clock. By default, it displays your current playhead's position in the timecode format. If you right-click on it, you can change the display mode. Timecode displays the standard SMPT timecode. Bars Beats displays playhead location in a musical time. It's actually Bars Beats Ticks. A tick is the smallest addressable musical time unit. Note that in this mode there's tempo and time signature buttons below the clock. Minutes Seconds shows a display similar to the timecode, but instead of frames, it shows milliseconds in the last field. And lastly, the Samples mode shows playhead position in audio samples. It also shows the current sampling rate below the clock. This one is for the cyborgs among us. Let's take a look at the other context menu options for the clock. There's an option to copy the current display to clipboard, useful for taking timed notes. Below there's an option Display Delta to Edit Cursor. When activated, the clock will not show playhead's position, but the difference between the mouse cursor and the playhead. It's useful if you want to quickly measure distances in the timeline. You can put the playhead on the start, point your mouse at the end, and the difference shows you how long that part of the timeline is. Note that in the difference mode, the clock is blue instead of green. Let me digress. There's a better tool for doing this, but you need to enable it in the preferences. Edit, preferences, appearance, toolbar, display selection clock. This will simply show you the start point, end point, and the length of whatever you select. Perfect! The last four options let you change the tempo and time signature of your session. If these are constant throughout the project, use the top two if you want to alter them. You can however make them change over time by inserting tempo and meter changes throughout the timeline. More on that in another video. Now, the secondary clock is no different to the primary, but it's useful to have two different displays, not just one. On the right side of the secondary clock, there's three buttons, solo, audition, and feedback. 
the first one indicates that one or more mixer strips have solo active. You can click it to unsolo everything. This one can really save you some time, trust me. The audition button lights up when there's an audition going on. Audition is playback of audio that is not placed on the timeline. For example, you can audition audio regions in the editor list, or you can audition audio files in the import dialog. You can click the button to force all auditions to stop. The feedback button will light up when Ardo detects a feedback loop in the session's signal routing. Because you can patch everything anywhere you want, there is a possibility that you'll connect an output of something back to its input. That's dangerous, and it might cause a resonance cascade. That's why Ardor will let you know if that happens. Clicking this button doesn't do anything. It's just an indicator. On the right, there's another panel called the Navigation Timeline. It's here to help you... well, navigate your timeline, of course. Any markers you create in the session will be displayed here relative to your playhead's position. The playhead is represented by the red vertical line in the middle. If you right-click on the navigation timeline, you can change the time range it spans, between 30 seconds and 20 minutes. If you click on any marker or place, it'll immediately move your playhead there. If you use the mouse wheel over the navigation timeline, it'll scroll the playhead forward and back. If you hold down Control, you'll get more precision. Control and Alt will give you even finer scrolling. On the far right, there's a small master volume meter and a master peak indicator. It'll light up in red when the master bus hits or exceeds zero decibels. Click it to reset. The last thing to the right are the mode selector buttons called Editor and Mixer. Using them, you can switch between the two main windows of your order session. Alternatively, you can hit Alt-M on your keyboard to toggle between the two. If you right-click on these buttons, you can detach any of the windows. It's very useful if you're working with multiple displays. I think that's enough information for one video. In the next one, I'll talk about tracks and the timeline. I also advise you to check out the wonderful Ardor manual, where you can learn more about user interface and other important things as well. I hope this video was worth your time. If you want more, subscribe! I also invite you to check out my own YouTube channel, where I cover other open source music production related topics. If you haven't already, go to ardor.org and download Ardor right now. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.